Let's dive right in. Today, I'm going to give an introduction on how to install and use the G-Scatter add-on for Blender 2.93. It's a long initial explanation, so check the timestamps to skip ahead. To start, I'm going to go over to the Grasswall 3D website. They've developed G-Scatter, and the beta is currently being released for free. I've added the link in the description. To install G-Scatter, simply download the file and place the zip in your directory of choice. I tend to store all of my Blender add-on files where I've installed Blender in program files. From there, we can open Blender. It's important to use at least Blender 2.93 as older versions don't have all of the geometry nodes features that you will need. Fundamentally, G-Scatter is an interface for setting up and using geometry nodes, an extremely powerful and newer feature of Blender. You may have seen them on my channel or in Brady Johnson's excellent video on creating procedural membranes. Today, we're essentially going to mimic Brady's video, but we're going to make our membrane in 10 minutes tops, including the step-by-step -step explanation. After the walkthrough, I'll show how fast it can be to make something such as a micelle. We'll then cover how to make controlled random materials for scattered objects, and we'll close off with some commentary on what G-Scatter is actually doing, as well as some recommended resources for anyone looking for more information. To make a membrane, I'll need phospholipids to scatter. I've made various styles of phospholipids available as free assets, and you can download them from Gumroad. Everything I make is free and has a public domain license, so you can use them for anything you'd like, including published articles. With that, let's go to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and we're going to start by making sure we have the Node Wrangler add-on enabled. This is going to be relevant to us later for materials. You can see this box is checked, so we're good on that front. Then I'm simply going to hit Install, I would navigate to wherever I put the zip file for Gscatter. I would select that and then I would hit Install Add-on. I've already installed it, so all I have to do is make sure that the box is checked. Very simply, let's go ahead, grab the default cube, hit X and delete it. From there, I'll hit Shift A and add in a simple plane. I'm then going to hit Control 5 to add in a subdivision surface modifier. And under the modifier properties, I'll change the settings to simple. Now I'm going to add in a displacement modifier, hit new for the texture, come down to the texture properties tab and add a clouds texture. I'll bring the size up to about 1.5 and I'm going to drop the scale down to just about 0.5. I have my plane, so now it's time to add some phospholipid pairs and I'm going to append those from an asset file, namely my own. Today, I'm going to go to file, append, assets, come to the phospholipid bilayers and in this case, this is the file that you can grab I'd then go to Object, and I'm going to choose Style to Curve today, and I want the phospholipid pair. So I'll hit Append, and you can see that is added to the outliner, and if I zoom out, the actual phospholipid pair is over here. And again, there are multiple styles available. I turn off subdivision in the viewport by default, just so that it runs a little bit more smoothly. So we're going to go ahead, select our plane, hit N to open the side panel, and come down to the G Scatter tab. For the surface, I'm going to choose the plane, and then I'll select my phospholipid pair from the outliner. You'll see, as soon as I do that, I now have an option to scatter this as an object or a collection. If I had multiple pairs, I might want to use a collection. For a single object, I'm simply going to choose scatter as object. Now at first, this is a huge mess, and partially that's because the phospholipid pair imported lying flat. To correct this, I'm going to come down to the X orientation and change this by 90 degrees. Now they're all pointing in roughly the right direction. You can see that G-Scatter has given us control over the rotation. It's also given us a ton of other controls. Let's start with the density. By dragging this value up, I can make a very dense layer. And because everything is still linked to the original plane, if I select the plane and tab into edit mode, I could instantly scale this up and get a bigger plane that respects that same density and populates quickly. Strictly speaking, you could make these changes to the original geometry in object mode, but whenever you're working with geometry nodes, it tends to be a little bit better to work in edit mode because it's going to update the scale as you go. We could also, if we wanted to, tab back into object mode and change the displacement at any time and the membrane would respect that. Similarly, if we really wanted to, we could add other modifiers such as arrays to extend this. If at any point you navigate away from the G-Scatter setup and lose all of the controls, simply select the object or collection in the outliner and that will bring all of them back. Let's say that now I want to adjust the scale. I'm simply going to hold down shift, left click and slide the scale to the left. 
this is going to make my phospholipids much smaller. If I wanted to, I could also add a slight bit of randomness in the scale. So zooming in, I'll hold down shift and drag up just a bit. And you can now see that some of these are smaller than the others. To compensate for the density change, I'll bring this value up again, just a little bit. And for most phospholipid bilayers, I find that I want to uncheck the follow terrain normals. So now everything is lining up straight. If I wanted to, I could also add some random rotation in the z-axis. So I'll simply scroll down and bring up the random value for this, for z, and you can see now they're going to go in different directions. Let's say I don't want my phospholipids to intersect each other, which you can see going on in various places here. Then all I would have to do under density is check the box for limit intersections, again hold down shift and left click, and just bring up the minimum distance separation until they're no longer touching. Then I can bring the density back up, and this will populate the whole film densely but without intersecting. As an extra bonus, I can instantly explore different versions of the position, scale, or rotation using the seed values. And really, it is that simple. In minutes, we made a phospholipid bilayer, and we still have tons of control over the final product. Let's say I want to scatter some proteins on or in this bilayer. In that case, I would simply add a new object, namely a protein, and then or a collection of proteins, and then I could scatter them using the same approach. There are a few things worth noting here, though. The first is that gscatter is using the origin of the object that it is scattering. That can make it difficult to scatter objects on the surface, since right now the object origin for the phospholipid is right in the center. If we want to change that, we can do so very easily by simply selecting our phospholipid, tabbing into edit mode, hitting A to select everything, and then hitting G and Y to move it, such that the object origin, this little yellow dot, is actually just sitting at the top of the phospholipid. So now you can see the effect is that everything has moved underneath this plane. Another worthwhile thing to note here is that I don't want this plane to actually appear in the final render, so I'm going to make sure to uncheck both the camera and the eye. So now it's no longer visible in the viewport, but I can still make any changes that I'd like to. In fact, if I want to go ahead and demonstrate the scattering of an object now, I can simply hit Shift A, add in, let's say, the default cube, move that off to the side, and now I'll choose to scatter this as an object. Again, you can see I've got all kinds of separate controls from the phospholipids, so I'll bring the density down quite substantially, I'll lower the scale, add in some randomness. Again, I can add randomness for the different rotation axes, and if I don't want it to actually have random rotation, I can just define a set rotation. Finally, of course, I can oscillate through different various positions, and I can increase the density if I want to. And you can imagine that this cube would make a perfectly good substitute for something like a protein or a collection of proteins. For now, I'm going to delete this so that it no longer appears in our system, and again, we'll also delete the default cube. One more worthwhile point here is that there are options for vertex masks that we haven't discussed. To make this membrane, I used roughly the same approach as Brady's video because it offers a lot of flexibility and lets you control fewer verts. What I mean by that is I can simply show my original plane, tab into edit mode, and because of the subdivision surface modifier, I'm getting a lot of geometry, but I only have four verts to move. So if I wanted to, I could grab this and move it out and I'd have tons of different options and control with minimal geometry to work with. However, gscatter gives you an interesting feature in terms of customizability. And to do that, I need a little bit more subdivision. So I'm going to actually apply this subdivision surface modifier with control A. And now if I tab in, you can see I've got a bunch of extra geometry. Once that's done, I can click on my phospholipids and using this vertex mask feature, if I click this, I've now entered weight painting mode. And what that is going to let me do is essentially paint on the areas where I want the phospholipids to appear. So you can see I can very, very, very quickly make custom patterns of where I want these actual objects to scatter. And for the phospholipids, you might want a continuous film, but if you only want certain proteins in a different collection to appear, say here or there, that would be a very good opportunity to make use of this tool. To finish, simply click the brush again, I'll once again hide the plane, and you can see we now have a custom distribution of these phospholipids. With all that in hand, I'm going to demonstrate very quickly how you can use this to make a micelle. Starting off in a new scene in Blender, we're going to make a micelle in probably just under a minute. I'm going to go ahead, delete the default cube, come to File, Append, add in my phospholipid pair once again. With Shift-A, I'll add in a UV sphere, hit N for the side panel, 
come to G Scatter, choose the sphere as my surface, and from my outliner, grab the fossil liquid pair, scatter it as an object. I'll rotate that 90 degrees in the X direction, grab the UV sphere, tab into edit mode, and scale up. Then I can come back to the outliner, increase the density quite substantially. Because I already have geometry, I can simply click for the vertex mask, and rather than try and paint on the custom sphere, as soon as I click this button, I created a custom vertex group. So I'll unclick this now, come into a side view, hit tab once I have my sphere selected, Z for wireframe, and then select all of the bottom points and assign these verts. We come back to solid view now, and again, we can simply hide our sphere in both the viewport and the render. We'll adjust the scale of the phospholipids just a little bit, limit the intersection so that nothing intersects, and bring the density up substantially. Once again, we can rotate randomly in the Z axis so we have a little bit of variation, and just like that, very quickly, we created a micelle. If we wanted a little bit of extra geometry to make sure we have no patchy sections, all we would have to do is grab our original UV sphere and add a subdivision surface modifier, let's say of two. We'll hide that again, and you can see this is now very densely packed. Again, I think I'll bring the limit intersections up just a little bit, and then increase the density once more. So very simply, a customizable micelle in literally minutes. Up until this point, we've been working entirely in either solid view or wireframe. My phospholipid models come with built-in materials, and if we hit Z and come into Material Preview, or Z and come into Rendered View, you can see that they're already randomized and adjusted. When you're working with any kind of distributed particle, it may be worth your while to have something that is a controlled random material. That is to say that you're going to assign something different to each individual instance of this phospholipid, but you want it to be a little bit different every time, and you want to control that difference. So to demonstrate how you do that, I'm going to remove this material and very simply create a new one. We'll open a new window, change to the shader editor, hit end to close the side panel here, and I'm going to do this in material preview. So I'll grab my phospholipid because that is where I need to assign the material. I'll hit new, and this is very simply the default material. As with any other material, we could assign something like a very specific color. We could make it metallic or shiny, matte, entirely transmissive if we really wanted to. There are tons of different material options. For now, I'm going to stick with a generic material. No metal, no transmission, and 0.5 roughness to start. Let's assume, though, that I don't want every single one of these to be the same color. We can add a little bit of randomness here. To start, I'm going to move over a bit, hit Shift A, and add in an input object info. Once I've done this, I'm going to go ahead and again with Shift A, add in a texture, white noise. I'll plug the location into the vector, and I'm going to change the type from 3D to 4D. You can also use the random output here, but the white noise W value is essentially going to act as a seed, so we could change things up if we wanted to. So if we go ahead and make sure that we have Node Wrangler enabled, so again, Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and Node Wrangler, then I can simply select this white noise, hit Control shift left click and see that every single phospholipid here is being assigned a value between black or zero and white or one. If we drag the W value, that number changes. And we're gonna use this to control all kinds of different things, but primarily our colors. So right in front of the principled BSDF, which I'll reconnect, we're going to hit shift A and add in a color hue saturation value. I'll hover over my color here, hit Control c to copy, and Control v to paste. So I can now plug this in, and I can use all kinds of little toggles here to control or adjust this value. If I wanted to, I could adjust the hue, saturation, or the value to control any aspect of these colors. So I'll reset all of those to default, and right now what I'm going to do is use this little random setup of values between 0 and 1 to control aspects of the hue, saturation, and value. The way I'm going to do that, though, is to modify the value first. I may not want to go entirely between 0 and 1. For instance, very small changes in hue can have very dramatic changes in the color. So I'd like to constrain that range. To do that, very easily, we're going to hit Shift A, come to Converter, add in a Map Range node. We'll plug the value into the value, and then we'll change the range. So instead of going from 0 to 1, we're going to have it go from 0.45 to 0.55. We'll add this result straight into the hue. 
And now you can see each of these has a slightly different hue. If we wanted to, we could also grab this node, hit Shift-D to duplicate it, plug the value in here, and again, we could set a custom range for, say, the saturation. I'd like the saturation to be quite high between 0.8 and 1. So we'll go ahead, plug that into the saturation, and now some of these are slightly desaturated compared to others. Because we're outputting these 0 to 1 or black to white values, we could also control all kinds of other things by making some of these metallic or shinier through roughness or fully transmissive or not. Similarly, we could control different aspects such as how much subsurface scattering each of these have. So if I wanted to go ahead and change quickly to the Cycles Render Engine, you can see we've got a bit of a different look here, and if I bring the subsurface value up, now the light is actually going to sort of move through this a little bit, and I tend to use this for biological looks. In any event, this type of random material is very useful for when you're working with scattering large numbers of objects, because it can add some variety. From here, very briefly, I'd like to show what G-Scatter is actually doing in terms of adding in geometry nodes networks. A full understanding of geometry nodes requires significantly more work, but this tool makes it very easy to take advantage of these controls. So if we come to the pre-made geometry nodes window, select our object here, you can see that every time we add a new object, it's essentially creating a series of different geometry nodes that are allowing us to add in all that control. G-Scatter essentially just makes this visible to us through a convenient side panel so we can access all of these things right away. And we don't have to worry about how to set up these nodes or in what specific order. And that is what makes this tool absolutely fantastic. If you are interested in learning how to add custom traits to your geometry nodes networks and to see some of the advanced capabilities, there are tons of great examples on YouTube. I'm particularly fond of Brady Johnston's tutorial, Arendelle, Red Jam 9, C. Bailey Film, Jimmy Gunnowan, and Johnny Matthews. Finally, to round out this video, I want to show some figures and covers from my reference catalog that could easily make use of G-Scatter. In fact, some of these will be covered in upcoming figure recreations. Right at the bottom, we have a wonderful scattering of little molecules as a background in a very Star Wars-esque style. We have a number of little proteins or bacteria, likely, scattered on the surface of a film. If we move up, we have icospheres that have been used to likely replicate gold nanocrystals. We move over to the side here, and we can find this fantastic figure from ACSAMI that has all of these little nanoparticles scattered on the surface. You can also use geometry nodes to create these kind of mesh networks, and these are particularly useful if you're working with, say, porous catalysts or materials in general, battery separators. Again, clusters of materials such as these, very well suited for geometry nodes and scattering. If we move a little bit further along, we can find more ordered materials that are arrays, Again, G-Scatter is going to make these very easy. Similarly, with films such as these, where you have some sort of different collection of molecules, the key point here being that all kinds of different figures can benefit from this approach, and that G-Scatter is a tool that's going to let you make these very, very quickly. And with that, thanks for coming out. Grab yourself a copy of G-Scatter. It's an awesome tool. Expect more scattering and geonodes for scientific subjects in the future. If you found this video helpful or informative, consider subscribing and sharing it with your friends and colleagues, or checking out my Patreon. Many thanks to my current supporters on Patreon who help make these videos possible. If you'd like to make use of some of the high-quality public domain free scientific assets that I've made, they'll be available at links in the description, or you can find them through my website, cgfigures.ca. And with that, as always, I hope you have a great old day.